All right, well, we're going to bring on Grammy-nominated producer, publisher, and author Rick Blywes, I think. Oh, boy. Uh, you know me, I can't do names. Not at all. He's a slacker. Look at all that stuff he's doing. Are you kidding me? All, all right, right, well, well let's, let's bring out. him on. Good morning, Rick. Uh, good morning. Good morning. How you doing? What part of the country are you in? I'm in southern Oregon, and it's uh, just after 4 o'clock in the morning. Oh, yeah, it's early. Yeah, about the time away. we get up every morning. <laughs> so what's the, what's the big thing in southern Oregon? What's the... Uh... Well, uh, in the area where we live in, Ashland, um, is the home of the Oregon Shakespeare Festival. Oh. Uh, the oldest right. repertory theater company in America. And the uh, Ashland Independent Film Festival, uh, which is one of the top film festivals in the world. And I uh, have Blackstone Publishing, which is uh, founded and still based here. Oh, how wonderful. Pretty cool. Very yeah, nice. There's also a great lake there called Klamath Lake. Not in that area, but in Oregon. Yep. It's, See, you say Oregon, I say Oregon. Well, that's because I'm from New Jersey. Yeah. yeah okay. Well, well we uh, we excuse you. For yeah. That. That's, thank you. <laughs> you know, I'm actually I'm actually originally from New York and New Jersey myself, so I'm not sure I stay stay correctly. <laughs> what uh, What parts of the state were you were you actually in originally? I was uh, born in Newark, and I was uh, raised in a combination of Great Neck on Long Island and Manhattan. Oh, yeah, wow. so okay. me, Sands Point, and Manhattan. There we go. We were neighbors. Yeah. <laughs> Good stuff indeed. So tell us how you got out to Oregon from New York and New Jersey and how you got into being a publisher and a producer and an author. Well, uh, as a uh, producer, a record producer, I just was in music my entire life, and I started playing in the rock and roll bands in the early, early days of rock and roll. And I uh, just never left music until I left New York in 2002. And I went from playing music to producing records to being an executive in record companies. Then I sort of retired and moved to Ashland from New York City and um, joined boards of directors and kind of got bored and uh, started writing, joined a writing group. I started writing, and I was introduced to Blackstone. I was hired there and started using all my knowledge from uh, New York and out here and transferred it from music to, uh, to publishing. Is there any recordings you were involved with over the years that uh, we would know about? Well, I... Uh, I, I uh, produced a record, which it depends if you were into disco music or not. For oh, one thing. yeah. Oh, let me ju- wait a minute. Let me oh, just come pre- on now. No, no. Let me just preface this, Rick. Uh, Frank has uh, edited every Billboard charted song, and we have 6,000 of them in the rotation. But I was actually a big we're fan the, of disco. Oh, yeah, but we're the only station in the U.S. who has that. Yeah. So well. he is a music. You're talking to a music guy. Let me just tell so you. So which, uh, which recording? I, I produced a record called Seven Six Five Four Three Two One. Blow your whistle. <laughs> oh, I've heard that. You sure? Yeah, we uh, we sold a half a million copies, yep, and it actually that's a was a record that popularized popularized whistles and discotheques. Yep, yep. Uh, boy, I used to play in the uh, in the dance clubs, discos back in the day, and that was one of, not a big pop hit, but a big hit on the dance charts. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we made number three on the. Uh, disco charts made number seven, I think, on the R&B charts, and it peaked at about 41 on the pop charts. Yeah, it's always kind of funny, and I always love songs like that because we put, add a lot of them into our library here. We, you know, we remember the songs, but they weren't big, big you know, hit records on the pop charts. And, you know, if they didn't get into the top 40, they didn't get really airplay in New yeah, York. Yeah, you, you know? play so, them all. Yeah, we play them all. Well, great. I hope you play it sometime. I, most <laughs> no, definitely. It's yeah. in our rotation, believe me. Yeah, there you go. If it was on the bill, it was on the chart. It was. It's rotating here. Yep. So let's yeah. talk about your uh, your uh, book now. Let's. Sure. The, the name of it is. Pinion Scorpion and the Barbershop Detectives. Okay, where'd that name come from? <laughs> uh, it came through research. I. Um, I, I postulated, it just came to me when I started writing the book, that his dad would be Egyptian and his mother would be Haitian. And so I looked for an Egyptian name that was cool, and I found Scorpion was an Egyptian name. And then they, I postulated in the book that his father traveled to Haiti and met his mother there, and she lived in a real region in Haiti called Pignon. And so I thought Pignon Scorpion would just be a very cool and different name for a title character. Where's the barbershop detectives come from? Well, he solves his cases in a barbershop, with the aid of the barbers, the shoe shine man, the uh, a young reporter, and a brilliant female bookstore owner, and so they become the barbershop detectives, uh, assisting him in solving the crimes. 
I love this. So this sounds like a series, by the way, Rick. Uh, well, I've already written the second book. It'll be <laughs> published you. next year, and we're out soliciting a uh, TV and film deal right now. Oh, of course you are, because it, <laughs> nice. it sounds very visual and different for a change. And I love murder mysteries. That's my. I grew up reading those. Those well, are my favorites. Well, I hope you'll enjoy it. It's written in the old style, if you will, with Agatha Christie. Oh, again. I love Agatha. I have every one of her books and have read every one of them. Oh, well, then you have to read my book. Oh, they, <laughs> I wish they had sent it to me. That would, I would have read it by now. <laughs> well, I, I will. I'll get your address and I'll absolutely shoot it yeah, to you. Yeah, definitely. Now, you have worked uh, with uh, Clive Davis, who, yep. God bless him, still around. Yep. One of the uh, pioneers of that business. Uh, Melissa Etheridge, who's incredible. The Backstreet Boys, Kiss, U2, Whitney Houston, the Bee Gees. So, you know, ha what else do you say about yeah, that? Yeah, can't get much better than that. Uh, <laughs> Saturday Night Fever, and this is Spinal Tap. I love Spinal Tap. That's such a great... That was such a iconic movie, because there was nothing like it. No, absolutely. And it, Spinal Tap was kind of interesting, because the, the Russ Regan, who found... Was the man who discovered uh, Libya Newton-John and Neil Diamond and others... Huh? He uh, made the connection to Reiner, and I was kind of Russ's marketing guy, and so he flew me out to L.A., met with uh, with uh, Reiner and the guys, and we formulated the entire plan for the marketing of the soundtrack, which was going to launch the movie, and I created the marketing plan for that whole thing. That was some marketing plan, let me tell you. <laughs> that was incredible. It's still It's still alive and healthy. It's a, oh, absolutely. And in fact, I think there's a revival coming. Oh, interesting. And it's funny. I think we saw a concert recently on TV of the Bee Gees. And well, there's a couple from, of them running. Uh, yeah, they, from they the keep 80s. Running, yeah. And, you know, we just sit here and think, you know, how sad for Barry that his brothers are all gone because that was a really close family. And absolutely. Yeah, one by one. And boy, what a talent that was. And yep. Well, how come? OK, Rick, because we're always we sound like old fogies here. It's like there's no music anymore. None. And and the people that are producing the music, they're just like PRing it to death. It's like the, you have to have an insane name. You can't be a Frank Sinatra. You can't, <laughs> you know, you can't have a normal name. You have to be Post Malone. Uh, it's just a Lady Gaga. Can your talent just speak for itself, please? I don't care what your name is. And the problem is they're so electronically produced. Nobody has. We don't hear voices other than Katy Perry and Bruno Mars. I, I don't really hear anything, and there even they have no new stuff coming out. The people are accepting these subpar music, and so you have people that are being PR'd to death out there, and the kids are afraid, like the Emperor's New Clothes, to say they suck. You know? Well, you know what I find interesting? I just read an article the other day, and I don't remember where it was from. You might look it up. That uh, older music is now streaming, accounting for more streams than contemporary music, and it is a problem of the contemporary music scene. Wow! Well, they find oh, look at that. They're waking up, Frank. Well, that's why they're <laughs> trying to hit radio with more fees and uh, trying to get oh, other us. ways to uh, yeah. make income because they're not making it from the new stuff. Yeah, out they're there. really killing us. I think we have five people we have to yeah, pay that's now. That's a lot of crazy it's stuff. The same thing. It's just crazy. But, you know, for the music, we have, by the way, we have 50,000 songs in our library. The 6,000 are streaming uh, and also on the air. I mean, it's really, you know, and we get some, the compliment we get on our music is that we don't, they don't hear the same song twice. And that's the key thing. <laughs> and yeah, I mean, they're all and songs. And Frank actually does a rock collection show live on Monday night from 6 to 8 where people can call in, actually. Remember live DJs? Yeah, from the 70s. From the, and everything from the 70s. Because you have to admit, Rick, right? Only decade where any type of music could have been number one, but they had to be great. Yep. You know, you could have this. Really good stuff. You could have the Doobie Brothers. You yeah. could have America. You could have anybody. I always looked at the 70s as great musicians, lots of the beginnings of some, uh, you know, great rock and roll, obviously, but and also a good sound quality that we didn't really have in the 60s. We had okay sound quality well, back then. Stereo. But once you got to, well, it was, but, you know, but once you got to bit. the 70s, it really sounded great. And uh, well, it was like you were, were there. People were stoned, that's why. Yeah. <laughs> yeah that's true. Maybe that's what, what it do is. We know? No, but it still sounds good today. So that's, does, you know, where you get from. Well, well, let's talk about the book a little more now. Is there like a surprise ending in this murder mystery? Yes. Oh, good. I Except can't wait it, to... It's kind of interesting because like the older uh, style mysteries of that era, you know, it takes place in England in 1910, the Downton oh. Abbey era. And um, it, it actually has three different crimes in it. But there is one crime that 
goes through the entire book and it has a surprise ending and I don't want to give the ending away. No, don't but do there's, that. There's a crime with a fortune seeker, there's a murder at a circus, and then there's a crime of passion. Ooh, the circus thing is the one I, I'm interested in because I work with the Animal Defenders International that close those all over the world. Um, yeah, so that's real. Oh, I love this. This Have you thought about the people you want playing the parts in this movie? Uh, I, I, I've thought about it, and because uh, we're out trying to get a deal on it, um, I'm going to let the producers decide oh, don't who do they that. want. If don't. you were going to ask me who, throughout time, might have been the person, I, I would... Um, Oh gosh, I'm not I'm not sure who I who I would pick particularly. Well, let me ask you: Is George Clooney in there? <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, he certainly could be. So could Sean Connery. Or oh um, God, I wish. You know yeah. who knows? Um, and um, there were some great Egyptian actors, you know, as well back in the day in the oh, 50s yeah. and 60s. So uh, any of them could have played it. And the book's doing really well. It's uh, I don't know if I'm allowed to say this. It's of course a, you are. It's an Amazon editor's pick. Oh, yeah, no, we, we definitely have that out there uh, because everything is on Amazon anyway. That's why it's called yeah. Amazon, I think. Yeah, but that, it, it was uh, voted the buzz book of the year by an uh, oh, independent retailer group. Pub, uh, Publishers Weekly picked it as a debut mystery pick, and uh, it's doing great. It came out uh, on Tuesday, and it's just really rocketing, and I'm I'm <laughs> floored. I, I'm... I'm Sad, happy, and I'm floored at the same time. Well, you know, you gave them something that people need, and that's a key thing. It's like, you know, the time of the pet rock, everybody bought one because it was timely. We need a good mystery novel. We hadn't had one in a long time. I used to read John McDonald years ago. Right. And, yeah, you know, we don't have that type of mystery. And people, just like we were talking to somebody yesterday, uh, Lloyd Schwartz. I don't know if you know who he is. His father, Sherwood Schwartz, did the Brady Bunch and Gilligan's Island. Okay. And, he, you know, we were saying they don't have Brady Bunch anymore. They don't have these wonderful shows on, on TV where people can say, oh, it's a nice show about a family. And you enjoy it. They have to kill each other. They have to destroy one another on the planet. And, you know, we want to get back to some of that stuff, some of the fun stuff, a good mystery where you can, you know, maybe not figure it out. Well, that's what this is. It's a classic whodunit. It's a throwback to that era. And it's great uh entertainment and escapism from all today's stresses and boy and do we need that <laughs> that's what the book is i i want people to be and enjoy it and try to solve the mysteries and have fun with the very colorful cast of characters all right what's your website for you besides the amazon where they can buy the book do you oh, have it, it's rick dot com and it's r-i-c-k-b-o-e-i-w-e-i-s-s dot com all right i beg everyone to go there and get a copy of this book i mean this is going to be the greatest escape you can have so go to amazon though because i'm not selling it on my website yeah no that's just to find out information about <laughs> right. you yeah so and i'm sure you have a link there for amazon for the book too right but yeah also you know i mean barnes and noble but i also am a huge supporter of independent retail booksellers oh that's too. and i urge people to buy it there as well yeah if you have a local bookstore please support yes, them absolutely. without a doubt well listen i can't thank you enough rick for coming on the air it's delightful i am so looking forward to reading this book i can't tell you it'll take me back to a time when i was like 15 and reading all these books <laughs> well i i will absolutely and i will find out a way to get uh, your information so i can get it to you all right you got it well rick have a great day enjoy go back to sleep <laughs> <laughs> i might <laughs> <laughs> i would if they let me <laughs> But anyway, have a great day. Thank you so much. You're welcome. All right, Thank take you. care. Bye-bye, Rick. Bye-bye. That was wonderful. Boy, this guy has really done an enormous amount in his life. Incredible.